Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Skyrim. My name is Camel, and more importantly, welcome back to the Curating Curious Curiosity series for a long-awaited new episode. In this video today, I will be curating to you the curious curiosities that can be found within the hold of Winterhold, not to be confused with the city. Now before we get cracking, timestamps for each of the curiosities in this video can be found down in the description and in the comments. Down there you can also find links to my other Curating Curious Curiosities videos and all of my social media links. Be sure to check all of that out after this video of course. So, Winterhold, also known occasionally as the Winterhold, is the northernmost hold of Skyrim and is one of the four old holds. To the south it borders East March, and to the southwest it borders the Pale. To the north lies the haunting Sea of Ghosts, with only Roscrea standing between Winterhold and Admora to the mythical north. Winterhold is the epitome of cliché when the other races envision Skyrim, a dangerously cold, frost-bitten wasteland masked in strange and lonely beauty, like an uncut diamond dusted in the frozen tears of the divines washed out by the winter white and blinding gales of ice razors. To the east there are the ice-encrusted mudflats and dream worlds of monolithic ice baubles swirling timeless off of the last shores of Tamriel. The south greets none, with its jagged crags and narrow mountain passes deterring travellers and explorers alike, rife with avalanches and freak storms, in which you might just catch yourself as an unwelcome prey to the uncommon beasts of the north. In the west lies elevated foothills and sorry, bitterly iced excuses for forests. The north is all shoreline with dizzying cliff sides, ice shelves, glaciers, fjords and cold golden beaches with the numbing northern waters lapping and crashing with ancient relent. Despite all of its treacherous environments, Winterhold manages to capture us and constantly grants us with awe-inspiring sights that few have had the opportunity to lay their eyes upon. An untouched and uncut ice stone, untamed and untamable. Because of this we can only find limited and predictable amounts of fauna and flora in Winterhold. By the water's edge we can find clams, Nordic barnacles, accompanied by spiky grass, which is the only flora resilient enough to grow in this frost-blasted barrens. In the water we can find more of the aforementioned shellfish, accompanied by large populations of fish, mostly comprised of salmon and the dangerous slaughterfish, all living amidst forests of sea kelp. In the remaining areas there are sparse populations of wolves, snow bears, snowy saber cats, hawkers, ice wraiths and a few other rare entities that we will stumble across during this video. Winterhold holds few noteworthy landmarks. The two most prominent would be the College of Winterhold and the Shrine of Azira, which was built by Dunma who fled Morrowind after receiving a vision from Azira herself of the coming Red Year. Fittingly, Winterhold's history is about as grim as the Hold itself. The shores of Hasarik Head of the Broken Cape is where Yskrimor first landed with his family when they migrated from Atmora. Sarthal was home to the Night of Tears, the event that led to the extinction of the Snow Elves, save for a few that fled to the impenetrable fortifications of the Forgotten Vale or to the underground cities of the Dwemer. And we all know how that went. Mount Anthor is where King Olaf One-Eye shouted the dragon Numenex into submission, whose head now hangs in the halls of Whiterun in Dragon's Reach. But most recently, the city of Winterhold experienced an event known as the Great Collapse. The majority of the city fell into the Sea of Ghosts as the land beneath it crumbled like wet chalk, plummeting into the frozen depths below. 
Suspiciously, the College of Winterhold remains standing, which has led to a great distrust between not only the people of Winterhold and the College, but most Nords of Skyrim are cautious of the magical schools. Now, the once great kingdom of Winterhold lies in frozen shards of the past and stretched shadows, built on untended animosity and bitter cold. But Winterhold still gleams a blue flame in our hearts. It cannot go unexplored, so without further hesitation, prepare for curation. Firstly, we have the Thief of the East. This can be found lying to the northeast of the wreck of the Winter War. Tucked away on forgotten shores, we can spy a tattered rag flapping in the wind like a serpent's tongue. At the base of this eye-catching bolt, we can find the Thief of the East, now a skeleton lying on its side next to a wooden crate, with an oar thrust firmly into the ground as the flagpole of the cloth that led us here. We can also find the pickpocketing skill book, The Life of Eslaf Errol, Part 1, Beggar. Most notably though, there is a hefty pile of golden ingots stacked lazily on the stand, probably in a salvage attempt to save them from the icy black moor of the Sea of Ghosts. Likely the result of a shipwreck, as is suggested with large handcrafted driftwood and wreckage scattered along the nearby shores. Whether the watery journey was an official trade route or the tribulations of a smuggler, we will never know. Although given the pickpocket skill book, it's likely that this person was no law-abiding citizen. But now they will lie forever alone on forgotten shores, and once we're done, not even their life sakes gold will remain by their side. Secondly, we have the Hawker Hunter's Camp. This can be found to the north of the Snowvale Sanctum. As we mosey on down the shallow embankment to the water's edge, the path we tread will be interrupted by a horse, and soon revealed a camp hidden away in an ice crag like a coin in a thief's pocket. There is a carriage with a number of crates and a coin purse beneath it. This, to me at least, suggests that this is no bandit camp, but perhaps belongs to someone who follows a more commercial trade than pillaging. There is a fire lit and blazing away to keep the winter's chill at bay in this grim bastion. Nearby is a roasting pot filled with hawker meat. There are two tents, both containing sleeping rolls. There is a knapsack containing random level loot. In the corner, there is a table with a light armor skill book, Rizlav the Righteous. There is also a number of hawker tusks, hawker meat, and of course, lying in the center of the camp is one dead hawker. So I'd say this camp belongs to a hawker hunter who butchers the meat to sell in either the city of Winterhold or more likely the markets of Windhelm, as that's closer and a bigger city with a bigger market. However, one question remains, where is the hunter or hunters? Leaving a horse like this and your entire camp is no normal way to depart, so they are either out hunting or something terrible has happened to them. Well, just to the north we have the next curiosity, which is the Hunted Hawker Hunter, where we can find exactly what it sounds like. A numerous congregation of beasts united by one cause to end the hunter's tyranny and murder. Hard to say which struck the mortal blow, but as a collective, they got their revenge. Not only did he not have their seal of approval, but he didn't have the approval of the seals. And despite there being two bedrolls back at the camp, there is no sign of a second hunter. On his corpse though, we can find many predictable items that we would expect a hunter to be carrying. Like we see often in Skyrim, the hunter has become the hunted. Next up, we have the Smuggler's Stash. This can be found to the east of Snow Vale Sanctum. Here on the foregone foothills, there is a break in the ice, a minute dale of padded snow and welcoming ice rocks accompanied by a wooden crate. At the dead end of the depression, there is a freshly slain hawker with blood-stained snow leading to a snow bear. Clearly, the bear didn't want to buy meat off the hunter, so he decided to get some of his own. Not so natural in the food chain though is crates 
and an old Nordic chest, and you'll be stunned to discover that the chest contains random level loot. Now given the wooden crates, I'd say that this is the hall of a modern smuggler, but given it's an ancient Nordic chest, I want to say that this site is much older, although the chest itself could have just been moved with the rest of the crates. The whereabouts of the smuggler is unknown, and they should make themselves a stranger until the current snow bear moves out. For this next curiosity, we have Fisherman's Folly. On the map, this can be found here, located just to the northwest of the wreck of the Winter War. Here, set up on the shores of the frosty mudflats, we'll see a camp has been placed, although it does appear to be a bit more detailed than the average tent and campfire we so commonly find. There are two tents, both with bedrolls. There is a fishing net strung up to dry and avoid tanglage. Naturally, this suggests that this is a fisherman's camp, or at the very least, whoever was here was fishing. It would seem they plan to stay a while as there is an absolutely bountiful bundle of firewood neatly cut and messily placed. The occupants of the camp not only fished, but also drank like fish, as we can see with this well-stocked crate of alcoholic beverages. The fire at the center of the camp seems long extinguished, despite there being fresh food sitting on the cobbled stone firewall. On a crate, there is a tankard aesthetically accompanied by a rather beguiling leather-bound journal belonging to one Advelt. I can't believe I let Skegger talk me into this again. If he just wanted to get drunk and swamp stories, we could have done that in front of a nice fire back in Windhelm, instead of on this godforsaken mudflat. But the fish are biting Advard. The catch will more than pay for the trip. Yeah, right, if we don't get iced in first. His boat's already taking on water. I guess we'll try again tomorrow. If we don't catch something, then I'm heading home with or without him. Hmm, okay, well, given the camp seems to have been abandoned, I'm going to take a wild stab in the dark and suggest that something probably went wrong. Now, just next to the camp, there is a grounded boat that has been dragged onto the muddy shore. Still nothing awe-inspiring. Ah, but if we gaze across the shivering salt, we'll spot the bare belly of an upturned boat, fracturing the surface of the frigorific mirror. Now call me a sucker for cliches, but usually an upside down boat in Arctic waters is a little bit of a bad sign. And yes, a few strokes around the boat and we'll stumble upon two skeletons bobbing in the black blue brine. This is no doubt both Advald, the journal keeper, and his careless friend Skegger, who suggested this wild fishing trip in the first place. Well, given their fates are sealed, let's have a squiz on the ocean floor, where we can find an assortment of items that tumble to the basal sands below. A lantern to help them see, a coin purse for unknown reasons, an elven battle axe, possibly for killing caught fish, a woven basket trapped in the unthreatening grasp of sea kelp, a knapsack containing random level loot, and the catalyst, tankards. These dopes were drinking and fishing in the Sea of Ghosts at the edge of Tamriel. A few too many, a man overboard, a freak wave, what have you, two drunk men floundering about in an ice-cold liquid tomb, likely drawing the attention of the local slaughterfish that fill this bay and live up to their namesake, being eaten alive in a matter of minutes by the very creatures they sought to capture themselves. Stripped barebone to waft weightless for eternity as two skeletons at the end of a sad story at the end of the world. And for this next curiosity, we have the Whispers of R.K. On the map, this can be found to the northwest of Yungul Barrow. Here, on the rise of a rocky hillside, there are numerous ancient Nordic stones reaching for the sky from beneath the snow. Along with the whirling specks of shale, we can spot ephemeral baubles of ghostly gossamer fluttering about the field. Wisps. Now, while wisps are fairly harmless and enchanting to watch, they do mark the warning signs of a wisp mother, who is 
never far from her beloved wisps. Atop the White Knoll, there is an ancient Nordic altar which has a shrine of arcane, with several offerings of gold, gems, sprigs from flora hailing from more summer-filled holds of Skyrim. A strange place for a shrine to arcane, but throughout the other Curating Curious Curiosities videos, we have seen Stranger. If we dare attempt to worship RK at this shrine though, as we approach the feared, Wisp Mother will rise from the ground to protect her territory. While she has chosen this shrine of RK as her stomping ground, I doubt there is any divine reason, as the Wisp Mothers choose all kinds of obscure and random tucked away locations to call home. So hopefully, this shrine to RK has been forgotten by the locals and none try to worship here. As if they do, they will only be smited by a wisp mother. You would think if RK had any power, he'd send someone to kill it. I guess it shows you the true power of the divines or lack thereof. For this next curiosity, we have the Animal Isle. On the map, this can be found to the northeast of the Chill. This is literally an island covered in animals, which might not seem that weird, but we are so far north, so far beyond the reach of where you'd expect to find all of these creatures. We have one snow bear, one goat, two goats, three goats, one ice wolf, two ice wolves, three ice wolves, one hawker, two hawkers, three hawkers, and one snowy saber cat. Half a zoo's worth of animals stuffed onto the ultimate sandy shoal before the sea of ghosts at the edge of existence. Mulling around like some kind of failed Sheogorathic inspired Noah's Ark. Although, with the combat enabled, they will just maul each other to death. Which is exactly what would have happened on Noah's Ark. Now speaking of things in the north, for this next curiosity we have the Tree of the North. On the map, this can be found just to the northwest of the wreck of the Pride of Tel Vos. For so long, I could not place my finger on what kept drawing me back to this location while filming this video. It really had me stumped. But then it struck me. This tree, this sorrowful, crooked, cryo-kissed, gnarled, archaic claw of wood reaching from the stone below, is the only tree in the area and is the most northern tree found in Skyrim. If we look around, there are no other trees to be seen. This is the last one. Even if it is dead, it still stands. And while we may be able to stumble upon logs of driftwood, they could have floated from anywhere. This tough old bastard, however, stands its ground, a sentient, standing proudly hunched where it will remain for centuries to come. Ah yes, up next we have the Frozen Friends. On the map, this can be found sitting to the due east of the city of Winterhold, under the collapsed streets of Winterhold in the Bitter Moor, at the base which has buried so many. There is a ravine that leads back up to the higher mountains. At the base of this pathway, we will spot two skeletons. One of them appears to have got their leg stuck in a bear trap and was unable to free it. Amazingly, their friend or companion sat with them until the end, frozen into a huddled position while attempting to stay warm. Beside them both is an apothecary satchel, which will contain random leveled loot, of course. A genuinely ironically warming sight that is still hard to bear. A friendship that lasted a lifetime even though the lifetime was very short. Although I personally would have just walked up the hill and got help from the city, but you know, each to their own. If they want to die side by side with help around the corner, let them do their thing. For this next curiosity, we have Rundi's Altar. On the map, this can be found to the east-southeast of Winterhold. Here atop a colossal ice shelf lies an ancient stone circle with a pillar and some ruins on the edge. Still hard to find amidst the snowstorms and featureless, endless washout of white. But here we do have something curious indeed. A body encased in ice. Something I do believe is unique to Skyrim. I don't ever recall coming across any other frozen corpses in this manner. So this is a man named Rundi. He is one of the four missing college apprentices. But what exactly led him to this fate? 
Well, it would appear that he was experimenting with frost magic, as all around this circular stone disc that we stand upon are frost runes, deadly things we must be wary of when approaching this location. However, on the ground next to him, there is also a staff of ice spikes. It's not entirely clear, but surely one of these two magical frost weapons are the cause of Rundi being frozen in the way that he is. Sadly, if we look on his corpse, he just carries his robes and his boots, which don't really help us understand what he was doing here. On the altar that he is slumped against, there is a soul gem in a silver bowl. There are also several rare alchemical ingredients, suggesting that perhaps he was an alchemist. Fortifying this train of thought is the alchemy skill book Manamago, King of Worms, lying behind the soul gem. So if we logically assume that Rundi was an apprentice alchemist, then it would make sense that he attempted to dabble in the destruction magic school and things went a bit frosty. If you're a cryo mage and mix a potion incorrectly, it probably won't end too badly. But if you're like Rundi and you're an alchemist and you dip your giant toe into the cold pool of cryomancy, you're gonna get iced, son. And interestingly, on the altar is a steel dagger, but it's actually a unique dagger named Rundi's Dagger. And while it holds no actual unique properties other than its name, Rundi and his dagger were part of an unfinished quest in Skyrim called The Missing Apprentices. Later on, we'll stumble upon some of the others. Next up on our journey through the curiosities of Winterhold, we have the Cold Camper. On the map, this can be found to the dead north of the Whistling Mine. Here on this clifftop, placed quite scenically, are two tents and a completely kaput campfire with a meager stash of firewood. Despite there being two tents, only one of them has a skeleton within it, suggesting of course that they died during the bitter cold of night. The occupant of the second tent though, now that is a mystery, perhaps dragged away by a snow beast as they slept. There is also a small strong box that will contain random level loot. Too few clues to answer the questions presented by what we can find. One body is missing and the other is dead, out here in the uninhabitable wilderness of Windhold, dying alone to the algific eventide. The thought is enough to chill one to the bone, evidently. For this next curiosity, we have the Hawker's Hall. On the map, this can be found to the north of the Journeyman's Nook. Through the massive ice shelf, there is a spanning crevice, leading deep down to the dirt and sand below. Sitting here, we can find three hawkers, enjoying the slight shelter from the frigid and sharp ice winds. These hawkers, however, hold a secret. Almost hidden by line of sight illusion, there is an opening in the ice wall, a cloaked nook to keep most oblivious to its whereabouts. And oh dear, blood staining the snow, a chest with a book and a pile of bloody bones. Did the hawkers do this? I'm not sure. We have seen the savagery of hawkers before on Hawker Island in Solstheim. They are definitely most capable of tearing man, myrrh and beast folk to bloodied sinew and a mound of marrow. Now the chest here will contain leveled loot as always and the book is the restoration skill book. Rain's hand. More likely this was dragged here by a smuggler or bandit than a healer despite the book being a restoration skill book. But whoever dragged this here was apparently unaware that this was the home of three hungry hawkers. Now just over the hill for this next curiosity we have the Winter Whisper Grove. On the map it can be found here just to the northwest of Journeyman's Nook. As we wander along the base of these jagged glacial palisades, we may just spy flickering orbs of a pale light dancing across the wind-carved porcelain plains. But we must be wary, do not let them drag you in. Don't let curiosity kill the Khajiit, as if we wander enchanted into the grove of albino sapphire samoliths, then we'll disturb the wisp mother. Treading in her home, she will rise from the wintry depths to greet us. Now what exactly a wisp mother is doing out here is almost impossible to say, as we don't really know the origins of wisps or wisp mothers, naturally making it quite difficult to say what they are or why they do anything. 
Some theories suggest that they are the ghosts of snow elves, and that the wisps are lost souls. Other theories would have us believe the wisp mothers are necromancers that sought immortality through undeath. Neither theory has been proven or disproven for that matter, and what exactly a wisp mother is or where they come from is still unknown. But enough is known about them to haunt the dreams of locals and keep them from exploring the wintry wildernesses at night. So we will take the moral of these children's tales and steer clear of this snow-bound banshee. Now moving over to the mountains, for this next one we have the Rocky Refugees. On the map, this can be found right here, to the north of Fort Kastav. High up in the unforgiving cragged blades of the Winterhold mountain range, purgatorily illuminated by a fading sabled sun, we can find a horrific scene. A horse and three corpses battered and half buried in rubble rock and snowfall. They appear to have been migrating with all of their worldly possessions. From where to where is unknown, but now that point is irrelevant. In the back of the cart we can find the enchanting skill book, The Enchanter's Primer. But we should make haste in salvaging all we can, as this mountainside is unpredictable. In fact, if we approach the area, we will actually be subject to a rock slide that could easily be fatal to those unprepared to be shat on by a cliff, as is quite evident with the pile of clubbered and crushed corpses. And moving higher into the mountains, for this next curiosity we have the Mount Anthor Pillar. On the map, this can be found right here, to the west of the Mount Anthor map marker ever so high up, even higher than the head of the Shrine of Azira. On this mount's crown, we can spot some kind of structure. It won't take us long to see that it is of Dwemer make, a small stone circle with two small pillars on either pole, with a greater central pillar drawing our attention. To be honest, given there are a fair number of Dwemer cities in Winterhold, I am surprised we haven't run across more curiosities left by the Deep Folk. Now there is a classical Dwemer face planted watchfully on the central pillar gazing out across the horizon observing the lay of the land now long lost of Dwemer. At the base there are two small Dwemer chests that will contain random leveled loot with a heavy dwarven warhammer on display in the center. But what is particularly interesting strange and fittingly curious about this location is what lies at the top of the central pillar. Seven potions sitting on the head of the stone monolith. There's one potion of stamina, one blacksmith's filter, one draught of light feet, one potion of true shot, one draught of water breathing, one weak stamina poison, and one potion of healing. A seemingly random concoction of potions, a mixture that leads to no particular conclusion. A group of solutions with no solution. A very strange place indeed, considering the Dwemer dug deep and bored their society into the heart of Nern. Unusual for them to build something like this atop a mountain. But it has sat for thousands of years. So let us leave it in peace, as to be honest, this mountaintop elixir of factors is a little bit hard to swallow. For the next curiosity, we have the Altar of Xrib. On the map, it can be found just here, up the hill to the south of the Sightless Pit. On this occult overlook is an ancient Dwemer structure which appears to have been transformed into a hecatomb of hedonistic ritual. With two stacks of three skeletons on either side of the stone stairs which lead up to the altar of Xrib, where one sentinel skeleton stands with sickly cerulean eyes shining bright. Seemingly a guardian for this altar, who this skeleton was or who the sacrifice were is long beyond conclusion. The altar bears some arrows, a weapon, some gold, a shield, and the conjuration skill book, The Doors of Oblivion. 
Most likely a necromancer or perhaps even someone so curious about oblivion came here and attempted the practices within the tome. Malefic, magical pathways that are best left unexplored, arcane mires of interdimensional sermons that should remain unuttered. Someone, however, attempted something of the sort here at this altar of Xrib, and have cursed this place and the souls most likely unwillingly woven into the fabric of the ritual. On a more arched note for this next curiosity, we have the Winter's Gate. On the map, this can be found right here, just to the north of the Shrine of Azira. Here, at the base of two mountains, where the valley forms a V, there has been erected a huge megalith, a massive archaic Nordic structure. In a sense, very welcoming out here in the godforsaken snowbounds, but in another sense haunting, as nothing else marks the sign of civilization nearby. It's just a shadow of a time past, and a great shadow at that, overarching the surrounding area, literally, and marking the transition from blinding white mountains to blinding white mountains. For this next curiosity, we'll be moving north to the Skeever's Fury. On the map, this location can be found right here, to the northeast of Yskramor's tomb. As soon as we arrive, we'll see there is no lack of things to steal our attention. Firstly, this whole scene is staged at an ancient altar of Talos, although no offerings seem to have been left. On the lower stone floor, however, there is much to be inspected. There is a dead Argonian, four dead Skeevers, one living Skeever, a bunch of scrolls, a cage, and some other knickknacks and barrels of wooden crates and what have you. We'll begin with the menials. Over in the corner is a stack of crates and barrels, upon which lies the alteration spellbook for water breathing, and an apothecary satchel that contains a single sprig of lavender. And there is also a scroll of calm. Scattered on the ground all around the corpses are scrolls of both calm and scrolls of fury. Now the dead Argonian is a man called Il Azti. He was one of the four missing apprentices from the College of Winterhold. On his corpse, he will have a variety of wizardry goods and his unique ring, Illus ring. Now I think it's quite clear what happened here. Although ironic that an Argonian, a race that can breathe underwater, had a spell book for water breathing, the rest falls into place. It would appear that Illus T was trying to hone his illusion magics locking up five skeevers in an iron cage and using fury spells on them. Then he would subdue them once again with his calm spells. It seems the skeevers were not having a bar of it and used their lockpicking skills to get out of the cage and kill Illus T. Either that or he had them in the cage, he used fury on them, then he used calm on them, calmed them down, then Illus T opened the cage, only to have the calm spell wear off, which left him in a rut, or rat in this case, having to face off against a mob of furious skeevers, which evidently did not go swimmingly. An ill fate for Ill as T. For this next curiosity, we have Velexane's Talos. On the map, this location can be found right here to the southeast of Pilgrim's Trench. On a small, sandy bastion lies a tor, crowned with a statue of Talos. If we reach around and wander on up to the shrine itself, we can find a collection of offerings, as was to be expected. There's nothing too special, a weapon, some bones, and the one-handed skill book, the importance of wear. An ancient shrine for an ancient culture, as I doubt anyone has used this shrine in recent days or even years. But what is interesting about this shrine is that it is Velexane's chosen place for his magical treasure. I have a whole video covering the pirate king of the Abyssian, the Dramora Velexane, but given there is a ton of lore and a quest involved in getting his loot, I won't go into detail here, but please feel free to check out that video because that's some really cool lore. Which is more than can be said for this shrine of Talos. 
Just nearby for this next curiosity we have Trius' camp. On the map this can be found right here just to the south of Pilgrim's Trench. On this sandy spit lies a camp alone being subject to the endless icy lashing of the gales that sweep across these shores. There is a lone basket sitting empty adding no value to anyone. In the center of the camp, if you could even call it that, seems to be a makeshift fire as there is no supply of firewood, leading to the conclusion that zero planning went into this. But what makes the fire being lit strange is the small shelter that has been built, as there is a bedroll with not even a skeleton, but just whatever bones have managed to last out here. Carrion and other scavengers most likely carried the other meaty haunches away long, long ago. But what is quite sad is this, a note on the barrel for Shelley. Shelly, your ship should have arrived weeks ago and I fear the worst has happened. I've set up camp on this rock as your ship should pass by here and hopefully one of these days we'll be together again. If you're reading this, I'm probably out hunting or bringing in some supplies. I'll be waiting here until I see your face again. Faithfully yours, Trius. Well, it would appear that Trius never saw his dearest Shelly again, as is indicated by the bones on the bed. His boat is also moored by the beachside, just reinforcing our fears that this is in fact him. What happened to his dear Shelly may be simpler than we think, for just to the north of his camp is a location known as Pilgrim's Trench. Beneath its wretched glass surface lies many ships that have been swallowed by the turgid arctic moor of the Sea of Ghosts. And more specifically, this location, the Pilgrim's Trench, has claimed the lives of many a sailor, traveller and wooden hull of ships. Likely Shelley was aboard a ship that sunk here. Ironically, her skull is probably being used as a mud crab's shell. With a name like Shelley, it was fate. Moving on forward, we have the Ice Wraith's Lair. On the map, this location can be found here to the northwest of Fort Fellhammer. Through a haunted forest, we can spot glimmering ice serpents weaving and jolting in a rigid flow through the mists kicked up by the whispering zephyrs. Ice Wraiths, formidable and frankly confusing enemies to face off against. Seemingly low on the thread meter, but can quickly put an end to any unsuspecting traveler's life. Their lair is shallow, but ghastly. Corpses and bones decorate the rubble the nadir. A freshly killed stag lies bloodied, and quite frankly, I don't even know if ice wraiths are going to eat it, or if they even eat at all. There is also the corpse of a bandit. He will be carrying basic bandit loot. Honestly, a place of little interest and great threat. Steer clear of this area or you may just be killed in cold blood. Nearby, we have our next curiosity, the Hunter's Overlook. On the map, this location can be found here to the northeast of the Red Road Pass. For some god or for reason, these two hunters have chosen a starkly open overlook to set up camp open to the elements and open to attack with zero shelter. Let's be honest, they deserve whatever comes their way due to their stupidity. Two hunters, a tanning rack, a fire raging away to subdue the abominable gales they will have to endure at this location. If there is one thing they didn't hunt for, it was a good spot to set up camp. So let's leave these two fools to freeze. Ah yes, now for this next curiosity, right on the edge of Winterhold and the Pale we have the Shrine of Dibella. On the map, this location can be found directly to the south of Dawnstar. Here on a small Sierra's tooth is a built up stone structure, seemingly tubular but holds nothing of architectural note other than the stairs that lead up to the altar which is crowned with the feminine and fertile form of Dibella herself. The Adra or divine of beauty and love, but more interestingly of making love. Guys, I found my religion. And yes, there are a number of offerings, mostly flowers for coaxing lovers and the illusion skill book The Incident at Necrom, which 
Scarily, illusion is not really something you should need for seduction. So how'd you guys get together? Um, illusion, deceit, and trickery. Oh, that's nice. Anyway, am I the only one who thinks that this is an odd spot to place such a shrine? I get it if, say, there was a shrine of Xenathar so travelers and merchants could get blessings for good trade and whatnot, but which people pushing through the frozen heart of Winterhold and the Pale are stopping by to get a blessing of Dibella? All right, guys, we're going to the North Pole. What do we need? The Kama Sutra? Yes, definitely. That's it. Hmm, actually, come to think of it, there is a giant's camp nearby. Maybe they need a little something to get their giant's club uh, up to scratch, if you know what I'm saying. Although I've never seen a female giant, so any female travelers, beware. You may get clumped to death in a different kind of way. Anyway, this shrine has been here for some time, judging by the erosion on the lady herself. So it must be doing something for someone, and the best of luck to them. May they spread their seed and sow the foundations of the generations to come with the help of this shrine to Dibella. Now for the next curiosity, we have the Dwarven Thief. On the map, this can be found right here, located just to the west of Sarthal. As we trudge through the fresh powder of this treacherous plateau, we'll spot some foreign objects that will naturally draw us towards them. And oh dear, what do we have here? The ancient and somewhat lacking remains of a skeleton, a deer skeleton, and a dwemer chest, which will unsurprisingly contain random leveled loot. Now I think it's pretty clear that whoever this once was found or perhaps even stole this dwarven chest from the nearby dwemer ruins, that pepper the grounded iceberg tundra of the land around us, and did so likely thousands of years after the dwemer zero sum, or whatever they did to themselves to vanish. But what is really interesting to me is the deer skeleton. Given the proximity of the two skeletons, I'd say that they were actually together. And not that I've ever heard of it or seen of it in the Elder Scrolls universe prior to the Elder Scrolls Online, but this may just be proof that some culture or at least someone in the Elder Scrolls mounted a deer or an elk. And yes, I know that in the Elder Scrolls Online, it's a big thing buying mounts that are deer or elk but the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim was released three years before the Elder Scrolls Online, so this may just be the first time that we have been subject to the idea of someone using a deer or an elk as a mount. I suppose it was a grim and frosty foreshadowing of the Elder Scrolls Online crown store. But with that said, it's still a really cool and rather subtle find. For this next curiosity, we have an absolute classic, the Frozen Mammoth, something we have seen before and I have covered before in my Elder Scrolls V Skyrim Easter Egg video. Check that video out, it's thick. On the map, this can be found right here, located to the north of Alftand. Now while we wade through the crackling, shattered glacier, as we calculate each step to avoid an icy tomb, we'll begin to spot mammoth skeletons and bones scattered about the place. And lots of them. This would appear to be some kind of mass hunting ground. And down at the glacier's edge, we will find something super cool, quite literally. A frozen mammoth, perfectly preserved in the ice, just as it was thousands of years ago. Upon a closer inspection, we can see that it was being hunted when it was frozen, perhaps taken eternal hostage by a blizzard or avalanche. But what makes this so interesting is the weaponry used to kill it. It is all of Dwemer make, except for the random loot steel battle axe. Ah, I love it when randomized loot ruins lore. If it's a Dwemer ruin, it should only hold Dwemer items. If it's a mammoth killed by the Dwemer and frozen over, it should only have Dwemer weaponry. Ah, what fools you are, BGS. Anyway, like a pin cushion, it has been pierced and penetrated by many Dwarven arrows and thrust firmly into its side are two Dwarven ballista bolts. Given that Alftand is just down the road and the majority of this weaponry is Dwemer, and there is the Mammoth Graveyard atop the glacier, it is definitely safe to say that the Dwemer did in fact hunt this Mammoth. Although what led to this priceless specimen being preserved like this is truly a mystery, just like the race that hunted it. 
And on to the next curiosity, we have Ice Crag Talos. On the map, this can be found directly to the east of Hobbs Fall Cave. Lying stealthily in the deep crevices and ravines of this frozen maze, we will stumble upon this Shrine of Talos. Dug deep into the towering ice club that stands behind it, this shrine, like so many in Winterhold, I sincerely doubt it has been used or is used by any modern folk. With his worship being outlawed by those damn dirty elves and the location making the trip life-threatening enough, I would be stunned if any locals made the journey here to worship. But as we can see, at some point someone did come and laid down their offerings to Talos, praising the god of man and the dragon of the north. We can find gold, a potion, boots, a shield, a weapon, and the two-handed skill book, words and philosophy. The offerings of a warrior that will sadly no doubt be lost to the ever-thickening hoarfrost and time, consuming anything that holds its place too long in these barren steeps. But alas, the sunsets and the winds groping frost fingers of the winter north grow more and more gripping. We should leave this ancient place to lie as it does and has done for centuries. Blazing on through into this next curiosity, we have Yisra's Beachside Combustion. On the map, this can be found right here, located just to the north of Ingvild, where Arundel lives, and we all know what he's been up to. Now, while bird watching or whatever people do on beaches, we might sniff a hint of singed flesh and molten guano. Amidst the blue, whites and golds dominating the geographical colour palette, we will notice a lot of fiery orange and black. Something's burning, and it is my curiosity. On the sandy beach shore, peppered in grass, kneeling in a hunched and tortured posture, is the charred charcoal remains of one Yistra. She was one of the missing apprentices from the College of Winterholds. It would appear she was attempting to dabble in the diabolical arts of destruction magic. Nearby, we can find a spell tome of Flame Cloak. It appears her Flame Cloak worked, as the entire area is cloaked in flame. On her corpse, we can find her unique necklace, but apart from that, the interesting elements of this location have been snuffed out. Just like Yisra, now a singed corpse crouched on a lonely shore surrounded by molten patches of bastardized black glass. Penultimately, we have the Knight of the Nine. On the map, this can be found right here, located just to the north of the Tower Stone. On this frigid cape, we will spot a waggling, flapping bolt of tattered cloth dancing in the wind. A skeleton holds the flagpole still raised into the air to mark the location. Now given this skeleton is not exactly together, but instead has fallen apart over time, I would say that this is very old. The chest that lies nearby is also caked in a thin layer of permafrost, reinforcing the age of this curiosity. The chest will of course contain random leveled loot. On the ground, we can also find the heavy armor skill book, the Knights of the Nine. But what really has me curious about this spot is the flagpole. Take a moment and think back. Have you ever seen this metal pole used in Skyrim before? A seemingly iron or steel pole with an octagonal shape, eight flat sides. I have honestly never seen this before and find it rather strange that a developer would make such a thing specifically for this location. Maybe it's a hint that there are only eight divines, and this would be the Knight of the Eight, although those are hedonistic and poisoned words of those damn dirty elves. Maybe it's some kind of easter egg for the North Pole and this is Saint Nicholas, a Knight of the Nine. I'm not sure, but someone should clean this up, it's really pole looting the area. Ah yes, for the final curiosity, we have something that piqued my interest, the Spear's Return. On the map, this can be found right here, located just to the northwest of Sarthal. Blinded by winter winds whipping the sight from our eyes, we can just make out the remains of a mammoth. Archaic remains, that is. Now you may be thinking, okay, I've seen plenty of mammoth skeletons before, what's the big deal? But take my word for this. 
This is special. As we can see, this has been killed by weapons. And again, you'll be thinking, well, yeah, we just saw a frozen mammoth that was killed by weapons. But upon a closer inspection, this mammoth is much more interesting. Just look at the weapons used to kill it. They are not arrows. They are not Dwemer Ballista Bolts. They are nothing other than spears. Yes, that's right, spears. You know those weapons that aren't in Skyrim? Well, it turns out they are in Skyrim right here in this mammoth's skeleton. Now, this is super interesting because spears have not made an appearance since Morrowind and they are a common fan request to be brought back into the game as a weapon. So firstly, the fact that someone at some point of Skyrim's development cycle made a spear, that's really cool. Secondly, the fact that we have seen spears nowhere else in the game is incredibly strange. If they went to the effort of making the model for it, why not use it in a few places? But just this one spot? Hmm. Odd. As you can probably imagine, I've played a lot of Skyrim and I've never seen such a weapon. And thirdly, whose spears are these? Initially, I was like, oh, they're clearly Dwemer. But I wouldn't be too sure. The alloy they have been crafted from does look similar to Dwarven metal but it's got a slightly purple tint, which would suggest that it is something else. The spear's staff also seems to be made of the same material and not wood. The design of the spearhead is also not very Dwemer-like, as they tend to have crafting styles that are very broad and sturdy, whereas this is rather thin, pointy, and flimsy. The motif on the weapon, I will admit, at first sight I thought it was Dwemer, but it really doesn't match up to any of the other Dwarven motifs that we see in Skyrim, running through all of their crafted items. So the alloy, and the design, and the detailing, it's all foreign to me. Also, if this weapon was a Dwemer weapon used for hunting, then why was it not in the Frozen Mammoth, which had evidently been laid siege to, and subject to a full Dwemer arsenal? So this is a strange spear to find. I mean, it's strange to find a spear at all. It may have been a weapon of the ancient Thalma or Snow Elves, as they were known then. But it seems a bit crude for their culture, a bit basic. But they did once inhabit these lands. The spear could also be a weapon used by the ancient Admorans that came here and settled here with the Ysglamor. The Admoran motifs have long been lost, and we really don't know what their weaponry looked like apart from the artifact Wulfrad, but that's not a spear. If these spears were Admoran, it could explain the strange metal or material that they have been made from. Some strange and now foreign and forgotten alloy mined and forged on the ancient northern continent of Admora. All conjecture, of course, but I honestly do not believe that these are of Dwemer make. These clearly belong to and were used by a different culture. But which culture is unknown? And why someone at Bethesda made spears and put them here, only here? That is weird. But with that, this curiosity did just the opposite of spearheading this video, but instead ended it. So with that pointy oddity, we have now fully explored and curated the Curious Curiosities for Winterhold. I do hope that you have enjoyed the utterly unique area with its foreboding frozen wastelands and whippingly windy winter wonderlands. The bitter yet beautiful tales told by this ancient hold, home to the foul mother Dwemer, the Atmorans, and now the Nords, who have all left unique, archaic, and strange offerings for us to find. So whether they were new finds or old friends, I do hope that you have enjoyed the curious curiosities of Winterhold. Thank you very much for watching, I've been Camel, and I do hope that you have thoroughly enjoyed the Curating Curious Curiosities video for the ancient and magical frozen northern kingdom of Winterhold. If you did enjoy this video and you would like to see more of these type of videos, please consider subscribing. It helps me know that people are interested in these kind of videos and in the long run will result in more of them. Now, if you do enjoy these CCC videos, please feel free to check out the links in the description. These, of course, will lead you directly to the Curating Curious Curiosities videos that I've already done for Skyrim. Now, if you did learn something new in this video, please leave a like, I'd appreciate it greatly. 
If you have any theories, backstories, imaginings, or explanations for any of these curious curiosities, please leave a detailed explanation of what your thoughts are in the form of a comment down below. I'm very interested in hearing some of your explanations for some of these ever so strange and curious finds in Winterhold. The community's collective mind power will be much greater than mine. I hope. So hopefully together we can come up with all of the backstories for these curious curiosities. Now down in the description you can find links to all of my social media, be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter. And if you would like to support the channel in a more personal way, you can of course become a patron or sponsor of the channel. Links to both can be found down below. As I'm sure you know, all of my time and energy goes into making these videos that I create for you to enjoy. So your support is most appreciated and welcomed in any and all forms. So thank you very much for watching, thank you for supporting the channel, and I will see you very shortly in the next video. I'll see you there soon.